our speaker. Uh, Steve Shadle is Serial's Access Librarian at the University of Washington Libraries, where he is responsible for library system services that provide access to electronic serials. Steve has been a key contributor to the development of concert initiatives that have improved access to serial content. He is a popular conference presenter and as an active FCCTP participant, has led dozens of cataloging workshops reaching hundreds of catalogers. Steve was a 2010 recipient of the Ulrich Serials Library Librarianship Award and is currently NASIG past president. And now I will pass the presenting duties over to Steve. Uh, thanks very much, Todd. Uh, while we're just getting set up here, I will go ahead and tell you that um, <clears throat> in, in, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, this presentation is based on a presentation that I did for Springer pub Publishing staff uh, both in Europe and in their New York offices uh, over the last couple of months. Um, and the reaction that I received from a lot of Springer staff was that they were they were very appreciative and really had um, didn't know how libraries operated with the metadata that they were creating, how it actually affected the end user. So I thought this might be useful to put out for the um, larger community. Um, I will mention that the examples, I haven't changed any of the examples. Um, so the examples are Springer specific. I, I took out some content that was, um, that was focused on Springer internal systems and Springer processes, but all of the examples when I'm talking about publisher metadata will be Springer, and I do apologize for that in advance. I just didn't have time to go out and try to find other uh, examples. Um, but I think because, because this is just being illustrative, um, uh, I think we'll be okay with that. Um, so the purpose, what, what we're going to be talking about for the next uh, 45 minutes or so is I would like to provide an overview of how libraries provide access to publisher content using publisher provided metadata. Um, I'm going to be, there are three systems that libraries tend to use mostly when providing access to licensed e-content. Uh, they use the library catalog, the quote unquote traditional library catalog. They use open URL link resolvers, uh, and they use, uh, currently they're using discovery systems. Um, I wanted to mention before I forget, um, I do have a couple spots during the presentation that um, I'll be asking for questions. So if you want to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A, we'll go ahead and cover them at that point. Um, so just to provide you with some background, at the University of Washington, I have some fun little facts here. I really, uh, it was, I did this, the first time I did this presentation was in Heidelberg, Germany, and, and I thought there was a certain amount of irony in the sense that um, I'm touting the fact that we're the oldest public university on the West Coast, uh, all of 150 years old when I'm in Heidelberg. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's a point of pride for us. Um, the, the fact, the only other fact that I want to focus on here is um, that we are the largest public university recipient of federal research funding, um, nearly $800 million um, in the last fiscal year. And we are about research, um, and we try to do everything we can to make sure that we support the research process here at the University of Washington. Um, so that's the environment that we're working within. Specifically talking about the libraries, um, our digital collections are approximately a half million licensed electronic books and electronic texts, and approximately a little over 100,000 online journals. Um, we also do a vast amount of local digitization. We have uh, about 600,000 locally digitized items and 300 collections. Um, and that's not just special collections, but that's also working with our faculty to, to showcase faculty collections and any number of, of uh, activities around there. Last year, <coughs> for 2011, we had 6 million journal articles downloaded. 
um, and had 9 million separate sessions on the library's websites. Um, so we are about production and there is no way that we could sustain or produce this level of activity, this amount of activity, without having systems in place where we can use things like publisher provided metadata. Um, it, we just wouldn't be able to do this without, without that content. The physical library is 16, uh, 16 libraries on three campuses uh, with approximately five, a little over five million visits uh, in the last year. Um, Seven million print volumes, six million microforms, and about 20,000 print serials. Um, we circulated about 1.8 million items last year. And in terms of reference services, um, I do want to also point out that we answered 15,000 reference questions online last year, uh, primarily through the use of um, OCLC's question point. That's still even though the collections, I mean, when you look at the size of the collections, of course, the digital library, it's growing and growing, but it's still not comparable to the print collection. And our reference services are that same way, but the reference services are growing uh, as well. Now, these reference questions, I sit on the information desk a few hours a week. Um, so, yeah, some of the reference questions answered in person are things like, where's the bathroom? You know, those are counted as a reference question. But uh, but even so, 15,000 questions answered online. Those the online questions tend not they usually don't ask about where's where's the bathroom online. Um, they're usually asking things that are more substantive. Um, besides, what are the open hours? When are you open? How do I get there? Kinds of things. So, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about our users. We're going to be talking about the user experience here. Back in 2009, the University of the Libraries um, did a, the systems office did a personas exercise. Our systems folks are stretched a lot of different ways, and so one of the things that we thought would be a useful exercise would be for the systems department to uh, to use a personas methodology, which is basically identifying uh, your significant user groups uh, in service provision, and then giving each service group a representative person, a representative identity, um, and then filling out that that person, you know, personalizing them as much as we can, both with things that are appropriate for how libraries can serve them and also just other other interesting things about them. So the five uh, groups, the five perso personas that we identified uh, were associated with these user groups that you see in the pie chart. The pie chart represents the total number of individuals in those classes. So of the people that we serve, Approximately two thirds of them are undergraduates. Um, quarter of them are graduate students. About ten percent of nine percent of them are faculty, and we have a small group of uh, professional students. Um, and then one group that's so small that they're not in the pie chart, but they are important for us from for um, development purposes is uh, the alumna. So of course they're all given names. Uh, we're going to specifically uh, talk about uh, two people today. We're going to be looking at Brooke the Beginner, who represents a first year undergraduate, and Richard the Researcher, who is a PhD uh, student. So let's meet Brooke. Um, what we did associated with each of these personas is we gave them a tagline or a phrase and Brooks, and these were taken from actual interviews that we had. Uh, we had interviewed people trying to develop and developing the personas and these taglines were taken from actual quotes. Um, I'd rather use an online article that kind of works than go to the hassle of finding a book in the library. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of other information on this slide that I'm not going to go over right now, but it provides some background information. Um, specifically for our context, uh, Brooke is a first year undergraduate. She hasn't declared a major yet. She's taking mostly classes in humanities, um, although she's also taking a biology class. She hasn't used the library website much yet. Um, but she will need to do research for different classes, for class papers and projects over the next few years. Primarily what she uses the library website for now 
is she uses it for reserves to look up course reserves. She checks the hours and the study spaces to see, you know, to, to support her studying. Um, she tends to start in Google um, and then if she's not with if she's not finding what she's looking for in Google, then she will go to the library's website. The only use she generally makes of the library website is the default search box. Um, so, so, and we think that Brooke is a fairly typical undergraduate. Um, that's about that's about all that she's going to be using within the library website. And let's meet Richard. Richard, the researcher, um, accessing full text. Articles online is my primary use of the library and is central to my research, but I still go to the library for some reference materials that aren't online. Now, Richard, he's a doctoral student in the College of Built Environments, which is our, our word for um, architecture. But he's working on a dissertation about public transportation utilization and incentives um, and computer simulation. He already has a master's degree. Um, so he's very familiar with what libraries can do. You know, he's he's already comfortable with the environment of the library. He knows what libraries can do and can't do. So he will use the library catalog. Uh, one of his databases of choice is Web of Science because he's trying to find uh, other researchers. Um, you know, he's trying to follow that citation trail to identify additional um, additional uh, content. One of the different, one of the big differences between Richard and Brooke is Brooke has isolated projects that she works on and she does research on. So for her, until she really gets into her, you know, third or fourth year, it's sort of like each each project is a little different. Richard has an overall goal. He needs to find out everything that has ever been written or is related to his topic of research. So he's not only going to going to use you know just the general library search engines and things like Web of Knowledge, but he's actually going to go to the source material. You know, he's going to go to, for example, the Department of Transportation websites to get source data. One of the other differences between Brooke and Richard is that Richard has to manage all of these citations and all of this metadata in some way. Uh, Richard uses EndNote. It's what it's one of the packages that we license, uh, citation managers that we license at the University of Washington. Um, whereas Brooke, again, because she's sort of you know paper here, paper here, paper here, she doesn't really need to manage citations in the same way. Um, so let's uh, talk now about uh, a situation that Richard has. Uh, Richard works closely with his faculty and with his other um, graduate student colleagues. And his, uh, his, one of his faculties told him about this conference, uh, that's this European conference called the Transport Systems Telematics Conference. And his advisor tells him that there's some really good stuff that's going on there you know, in his area, and he should probably check out the proceedings and see if there's anything that would be of interest to him. So Richard, being experienced with the library, goes to the library catalog. Now, historically, the library catalog was a record of what the library physically held uh, in its buildings. Um, beginning in the mid-1990s, libraries started including online licensed resources in the library catalog. So the whole concept of a library catalog has changed over the last um, probably 15, uh, 15, 20 years from being uh, an accession or basically an inventory, a very searchable inventory that includes a lot of access points, uh, but it's focused on the library's collection. Uh, it has changed to a portal uh, of what a library can provide access to, both licensed and unlicensed resources. The library catalog historically has never included journal articles. Um, we don't have the cataloging staff to devote to every single catalog and every single journal article, and there are services that provide that, the access to that type of content. So there's no reason for uh, library catalogs to include that. Uh, most libraries have had separate 
indexes or databases that they use um, to provide access at, uh, at that level. And most library catalogs are still MARC based. So any data that is intended for the library catalog still needs to be a MARC record, generally. Um, so Richard goes to the University of Washington Libraries catalog and he does a keyword search on transport system telematics. Here's the result that he gets in the library catalog. When he looks through them, he sees that the first two hits are um, exactly what he wants. They are the 2010 and 2011 proceedings of this conference that he's looking for. So perfect, bingo, exactly what he's looking for. So he goes ahead and pulls up the uh, 2011 conference and he sees that this is part of, first of all, it looks like an e-resource. Um, it's part of a package that we get from Springer. And there's a link in the record that is intended for him to use that says Springer link connect to this title online, UW restricted. So he clicks on that link and then he gets taken to the Springer website to the conference proceeding in the Springer website. Okay, this is a pretty straightforward example using the library catalog uh, to provide access to the uh, conference proceedings. Now how that happens is there's a MARC record in the library catalog with that URL and that text sitting in a uh, 856 field in the MARC record. So how does that MARC record get there? Well, there's a lot of different record sources uh, that can be used by libraries. Uh, one, one possible source is you can go directly to the publisher. A number of publishers actually provide MARC records for everything that they sell, for everything that they license. So in the case of Springer, you can go to the Springer download website and pull down MARC records free of charge for um, any of the resources that they license. Uh, here's an example. I know it's a little small, so you can't really see it, but here's an example of um, the MARC record that they provide for that proceeding. Now, if you actually look in our catalog, the MARC record that we provide is slightly different because we get our records from OCLC, but OCLC also uses this record as the basis for, um, the, for the catalog record that, that is in WorldCat. So that's a pretty straightforward um, example using the library catalog. Are there any questions about that example first? I know uh, most of you are in, are working in libraries, are coming from libraries. I have a small number, I think there's about a half dozen of you that are actually publishers or content providers. So any questions about the, I'll give you just a second, any questions about the library catalog or about the MARC record in terms of um, providing access to uh, full text content? Okay, so next what we're going to talk about is the library link resolver. An open URL link resolver is a service that takes a citation that's formatted as an open URL, so it takes uh, typically an article citation, and then it displays to the user the library services that are related to that citation. These services can include accessing the online full text, placing an interlibrary loan request, searching the library catalog, or finding related resources. So one of, the, one of the pieces of the link resolver that drives all of the services is called the knowledge base, the open URL knowledge base. Now this is not a computer science definition or a computer science um, understanding of a knowledge base. A library, Open URL knowledge base is basically a database that contains information about uh, the electronic resources, such as e-journals and e-books, that a library either licenses or is going to provide access to through the library systems. And it provides information about their availability and accessibility. So using the knowledge base, an open URL link resolver can determine if a specific item, like an article or a book, is available electronically and it can identify the appropriate copy to display for a user. So I'm going to take you through the process of open URL linking so that you can so that you have a better understanding of how this works operationally. 
So say Richard starts in Web of Science. I know, again, the graphics are small. You, you can't see all the detail. But he finds a citation in Web of Science that he's interested in. Now, what happens is Web of Science is referred to as a source because it's going to be the source of the citation. Now, open URL sources um, can typically be customized to include library-specific uh, logos or links. So if you see that little purple box there with a purple W and it says, it says check for full text, that is, we have profiled that with Web of Science so that that is the button to our, that goes to the link resolver. So if Richard clicks on that button, what happens behind the scenes is there is an open URL, which is basically, again, a URL that has citation elements in it. That URL goes to our link resolver, which we use Serial Solutions 360 link. So it goes to, to the link resolver that is maintained by Serial Solutions. Now you'll notice in this open URL, there are elements, citation elements in there. There's an ISSN for the article, a DOI for the article, a date of the article, various citation elements. The link resolver, 360 link, then looks up in the knowledge base. It'll take some element out of that open URL, like the ISSN. You can think of the knowledge base essentially as a spreadsheet. And it looks for that ISSN. It looks for an entry in that ISSN, that ma in that knowledge base, that matches the ISSN and the date. So we see the, the entry here. Is, has that same ISSN as what's in the URL, and the date, the 2011 date, matches on the start date 1997. So the link resolver knows that this article should be available from Springer, from Springer Link. So then the next thing that the link resolver does is it takes that entry, and the link resolver has all of the information about how to create the actual full text link, the canonical link. It knows the rules for Springer so that it can create a link uh, to Springer link that will get the user to the full text. Now, the way Springer link works, and I know Springer's in the process of changing, um, of changing platforms, so I don't know at what point this will no longer be valid. But Springer Link has a canonical link set up for their content that is that is essentially uses the DOI. So if the DOI comes over from the source, then the link resolver knows, oh, for Springer Link, I can just take that DOI, plug it into this URL, and then give that to the user. Okay, so and so that's what it does. So the link resolver knows for all of the targets, it knows how to generate a full text URL. Um, a URL that will get the user to the full text. Okay. Now, so essentially what a link resolver does is it parses the citation elements from the source open URL, it tests those elements against the library, library's knowledge base, it identifies targets based on those test results, and then it creates and offers links based on the linking logic. Okay, so those are essentially the four things that a link resolver does. So let's take a quick look at an open URL. Uh, as I s tell people sometimes when I talk about the, what I do in my job, it's sort of like, you know, I don't want your job, you don't want my job, because I, I have to deal with this kind of URL on a regular basis. This is, this is my life. It looks really messy until you actually do some formatting on this and you realize that an open URL is basically just a little bit of header information up at the top here uh, that, sa that says, okay, we're, we're using a Serial Solutions Link Resolver. And then the rest of this is an article title, the, uh, the author's first name, the author's last name, the, the date of the article, the start page, the end page, the fact that it's an article, the ISSN, all of this information is basically essentially just citation information for this particular citation. So that's, that's all an open URL is. So that information gets passed off to the link resolver and then, and then the link resolver works with it. 
So why do libraries use link resolvers? Seems like a fairly complex um, system and prone to breakage because you're working, because in order for link resolution to work properly, the source has to be providing good information and the target has to act in a regular fashion in order to be able to uh, create a link to it. And all of this, your knowledge base has to be current and up to date for, for everything to work properly. So why do libraries use this piece of what is a little cumbersome technology? Why don't libraries just go right to the pub? Why don't why don't users just go right, right to the publisher website? Well, there's there's a couple reasons why libraries really rely on link resolvers to provide access. The first one is that the traditional library catalog navigating that catalog is time consuming. So, prior to having a link resolver, what a user would have to do is if they had an article citation, they would go to the library catalog. They would do a search of the, of the journal title. First of all, they would have to remember the, to search the journal title and not the article title. Then they get a result and they have to identify which is the correct journal in this set of results. So then they click on that link and they get to the record for the journal. And that's where there's a link to the journal title, the e-journal title. But again, that link only gets you to the journal homepage. That doesn't actually get you to the article yet. So then you have to look at the journal homepage and navigate that as well. Okay, so I have a 1999 citation here. Okay, where's that 1999 link down here? Oh, there's the 1999 link. Okay, so the user has to click on that 1999 link. And then they just get to the list of issues from 1999. They have to go back to the citation and figure out which issue they're looking for. Oh, it's that issue. Okay, click on that link. Oh, now I get all the articles in the issue. So let me see, where is that article? I'm looking for that one there. Okay, so I click on that link. And then, oh, but I'm still not at the article yet. I see that there's a PDF link there. So I actually have to click on that PDF link. And then finally, I get to the article. And that took eight clicks to get the user from the library catalog with the citation to the actual full text. Now think about how much easier it is for the user if they can do that in one click directly from the source of the citation that they're using. Um, now when we first started, when we first started, got a link resolver in place, and actually for several years, we had library staff who were not comfortable with the magic behind the scenes. We had a couple of public service staff who actually would still attempt to take the user through this process. Um, and this process is useful to know if for some reason link resolution doesn't happen correctly, but it's not really what you want your user to go through on a daily basis. So another reason that we use a link resolver is to get the user to the appropriate copy. Now, in this particular case, um, there's a citation for this journal, Integrative Physiological and Behavioral Science. Now, we don't order we don't order this directly from Springer. We have not purchased this title from Springer. So, if the user tries to go to the Springer website and goes to this journal title, they'll get this little note up here that says access to this content is restricted to subscribers. However, we do have access to this, to this journal title. We just have it through EBSCO. So one of the other reasons that we, the libraries use link resolvers is as long as publishers are licensing their content to third-party providers like EBSCO and ProQuest, we need to be able to get the user to that content rather than to the publisher's version if we do not subscribe to the publisher's version. Okay, so that's another another reason for the link resolver. A third reason to use a link resolver is that it can provide alternative services if the full text, if the library has not licensed the full text. So here's an example of an article from a journal called Expert Evidence. Again, if the user went directly to Springerlink, they would get the same access to this content as restricted to subscribers message. But it turns out the University of Washington does not subscribe to this online at all. So we're not going to be able to provide the user a, a link to the full text directly. So in that case, 
because it's not profiled in the knowledge base, the user gets a display that says, you know, we'll get a copy of this for you. Just click on this link and we'll get a copy of this for you somehow. We might have it in print. We might have to get it from another library, but we'll get it for you. But then if you, but you, we can also provide you these uh, catalog searches if you think you actually, if it might be in the UW catalog or if you're familiar with that, then you can search the library catalog. So what we're doing is we're providing additional services in the case that we can't actually get the user to the full text through the link resolver. So are there any questions? I know this is fairly basic, but this is really aimed towards uh, publishers, and I hope you librarians are getting something out of this. Um, are there any questions about link resolvers at this point before we go on to the library discovery service? Okay, I don't see any typing, so. Okay, the third way that libraries uh, often provide co access to full text content is through the library discovery service. The discovery service is essentially a search interface to pre-indexed metadata uh, and or full text documents that are made available or licensed by a library. So the key point here is that all of the metadata that describes the articles and the content is pre-indexed in one index, in one single index. Some of the characteristics of discovery services is they have simple search, um, similar to what users have gotten to, used to with Google and other web search engines. They are comprehensive. They basically serve as a good starting point for people doing research. To me, that's one of the key, uh, key um, quality factors in a discovery service. Um, when we first started doing development work with OCLC on uh, WorldCat Local, um, our goal was to be able to serve up to undergraduates most of what they would need for their standard research papers, for their standard research um, within the discovery service. And I think more or less we've done a good job. Some of the feedback we've gotten is that actually a lot of graduate students basically just use the discovery service as well and only go to secondary databases if they're not able to find what they're looking for. Um, some other characteristics of a discovery service, because you're working with a single index, the, it, they should have fast response times. Uh, that's one of the big differences between a discovery service and a federated search service is that federated search sometimes takes forever because it's going out and pinging individual separate databases and then trying to consolidate the information you know, after the search has already been executed. One of the other characteristics of a discovery service is that you can include local collections in addition to your licensed resources. So it's not just the stuff that's in your knowledge base, but you can also bring in all of those 600,000 digitized items if you have some way of um, like harvesting that metadata and including it in your discovery service. And the last point on the discovery service is that it supports the uh, get as well as find. What I mean is that a good discovery service will make it as easy as possible for the user to get something. It won't require the user to go, for example, if an interlibrary loan is required for the user to actually get something. The library doesn't hold a copy of it. Um, there's no electronic version, so uh, the only way someone's going to get something is from another library. You don't require the user to go to another system where they have to type in the citation there, where they have to work with that system in addition. Instead, you route the request to another system automatically. You don't route the user to the system. So a, so a good discovery service will support that obtain function as well as the discovery process. So. The discovery service we use is uh, OCLC WorldCat, WorldCat Local. Um, that'll be changing over the next year, but for right now, this is what we're using. Uh, WorldCat Local, or OCLC WorldCat includes 681 million article citations, 30 million digital items, mostly from these large uh, digitization projects, um, 13 million electronic books, 
and records for 225 million uh, books and other materials that have been cataloged historically on OCLC. So that's the content of the discovery service we're using. So let's talk a little bit about Brook. We haven't talked about Brook yet. Brook is taking a medieval English literature class, uh, English 220, and she knows that she needs to do a research paper. Uh, it's on the topic of her choice. Brooke knows that she's got to start her paper early this quarter. She's got several deadlines and some other stuff that's happening towards the end of the quarter. So in one of her early lectures, the um, professor talks about um, this characteristic of uh, Latin literature that was also seen in medieval English literature, early medieval English literature, called the concept is called opus geminatum, that basically it was um, a practice to create a work that was both in prose um, and in text, so in or in some kind of poetry, some kind of literary form, but then also prov to provide a textual version. That was a very common characteristic. So Brooke's thinking about a research topic, and she's sort of interested in this idea of of um, you know different texts meaning the same thing, you know, and that the author would do this, and but she doesn't remember the phrase opus geminatum. So she goes to the library discovery service. She goes to the library's homepage and she goes into the search box and types in paraphrase. She remembers the concept of paraphrase. So paraphrase Anglo-Saxon literature. She starts out with a, with typing just paraphrase and that gets her just some really that's not what she's looking for. So then she adds some terms to it. So she goes paraphrase Anglo-Saxon literature. Uh, what she gets uh, in the results. Um, she gets uh, a couple books at the top, which look like they might be okay. They're talking about English poetry and prose, but then she sees that third entry, uh, which is an article in a Springer journal uh, that's titled Opus Geminatum in Anglo-Saxon Literature. And she's like, oh, Opus Geminatum, that's right. That's the term that my professor used. Okay, so let me see what else I can find. So she goes ahead and then she goes to, oh, and then she looks up, she looks up the entry here uh, and she sees the check for full text at UW uh, button, and she also sees those other view full text buttons. So she clicks on the first one, the check for full text at University of Washington, and she gets taken to the full text of the article on Springer Link, okay, because link resolution has worked correctly. So then she needs to do more research, and she realizes that she remembers that phrase, opus geminatum, she's written that down now. So she decides to go ahead and type that phrase into Google search. And she gets some more things. The first thing is a Wikipedia entry for one specific example of Opus Geminatum um, that will provide her with some background. Um, she also gets, you can see the second entry and the fifth entry are both for the same Springer article. Okay. But she doesn't recognize that immediately. So after she looks at the Wikipedia article, then she clicks on the second one and it takes her to Springerlink again. And she doesn't think anything about this. She gets there and she's like, oh yeah, that's right, I've already seen that. But the question for the, li for the library is, well, how did that work? They went from Google directly to this, to this text that is licensed by the University of Washington on a private site. Well, the University of Washington, the libraries here, we have profiled our IP ranges with Google. So that Google is able to recognize the fact, oh, this is a University of Washington person. And when that University of Washington person clicks on that link, there's a referral IP that goes to Springer. And then Springer gets that referral IP, and you can see that Springer has identified this person as the University of Washington because they have it up here that you're from the University of Washington. Springer has identified that person as a UW um, person and then says, oh, well, we can provide the access for that, for this article. So Brooke has no idea, probably, that the library has really done this on her behalf. And so she has, you know, she has the impression that Google's, everything's on Google. But again, 
our what we try to do with the libraries is to provide our services where the users live. So if we have users who live in Google or in Google Scholar, you know, that's where we need to be able to provide access. So that's basically um, how access worked for Brooke uh, going through the library discovery system and going through Google. Now, one of the other characteristics of a discovery service that I've already mentioned is the fact that it's a, um, we like to think of it as a one-stop shop. A discovery service is comprehensive enough that it will provide um, most of the needs, it'll serve most of the needs for undergraduate research and much of the needs for uh, graduate and faculty research. So if you look at the formats um, for, for um, Brooks search, it's the kind of results that you would expect for something that's a fairly esoteric topic. Um, most of it is text-based um, books. Uh, there's two, I don't know why, but she, got, she retrieved two CDs, one computer file, and one journal that appears to have uh, triggered those keywords. But one of the characteristics, again, that one-stop shop, if you have someone who does a search uh, using the terms Jesus Christ Superstar, and they could be doing research in anything, or they could just be looking for the looking for the movie or looking for the audio, you know, to, for their personal enjoyment. But it becomes much more clear the power of the discovery service when you look at sorry about that. When you look at all of the formats that that result from a search like Jesus Christ Superstar. So um, one of the one of the um, characteristics of the metadata that support library discovery is the fact that um, a, a discovery service uh, typically uh, is taking metadata from a number of sources, including publishers. Publishers provide a lot of the, much of the content directly that is in discovery services. That all of that incoming metadata there still has to be some kind of an underlying set of data elements in the discovery system uh, in order for indexing to work properly so that all of the incoming metadata has to be mapped to that underlying set of data elements. Um, and that underlying data element set must be rich enough to be able to provide robust search. So the example that I sort of skipped through real quickly on Jesus Christ Superstar, you know, you had audio recordings, you had video recordings, you had text, you had um, online stuff, you had a whole bunch of kinds of things. So the, the data element set, the underlying data element set has to be rich enough to provide search on any number of not just formats, but authors, dates, you know, however the user um, is going to be searching. And the data must be accurate. So let me provide um, a couple examples, just some really minor examples of when the data doesn't quite work as intended. Um, so here's the here's the format facet um, from the Jesus Christ Superstar search. So I went ahead and took a look at some of the some of the formats that seemed a little questionable to me, um, just to see what was sitting behind them. So we're going to look at some of the search results that are under each of these formats. So for example, there's a format uh, that is labeled as book, and then underneath book it's labeled as microform. So it's supposed to be a microform book, but when you actually look at the record for it, you see that what it is is a um, collection of uh, files, an organization file from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And one of the files had some reference to Jesus Christ Superstar um, in the file. There was some kind of an entry for this. Now. In a sense, you could consider this a microform book, but actually it's more like, if you look, scroll down this list a little bit, look down this list of formats, it's really archival material. What we're really talking about here is an archive of the materials, the papers of the NAACP. So somehow the tagging or the coding of this particular metadata that was sent to, to WorldCat Local wasn't done correctly. Um, Another example is um, 
underneath the article facet, there's supposedly some articles are chapters, which is a little puzzling because I never think of an article as having a chapter. Um, and when you click on this entry, when you limit by this facet, one of the entries that you see is for, um, it's obviously something called Jesus Christ Superstore, that the edition is, the format is called a chapter, but it has a playing time and it has a link, and this is from Alexander Street Press. And Alexander Street Press hasn't done this across all their things, but I think there was probably early on a set of records that they provided to WorldCat that must have had some format indicator not set correctly to indicate that this is audio content. Instead, this should actually be showing up under um, a sound recording format rather than under an article format, because this is not an article. This is basically a link to a file. Um, and then the last example here is for uh, something that's called a computer file. Now in OCLC terms, computer files are mostly things that are not textual, that are really digital in nature like software or games or that kind of thing. But there's obviously an e-text here that is, that is appearing under the computer file. Uh, facet, then it actually is a, a thesis, someone's thesis from Bowling Green State University. So it should actually be appearing under the thesis and dissertation facet rather than under the computer file facet. So these are just some examples of where the, the map, either the mapping or the coding in the metadata between what the what the publisher or the provider is contributing versus what the met, what the discovery system is actually using uh, isn't quite in sync. There's something not quite right working there. And another, again, one of the complexities. So I see that there's a question uh, about how, about registering for Google. Um, how did you register with Google? I know how one registers with Google Scholar. To tell you the truth, I didn't handle that registration. It was our library systems folks. Um, I assume that registering in Google is the same way. I mean, I, I was involved with registering for Google Scholar. So I assume either that um, Google in general did that, because that search was a Google search. It wasn't a Google Scholar search. Um, so I assume either Google carried Google Scholar, uh, those IP ranges were carried over into Google in general, um, even though they don't do the find and library links in, in regular Google. Um, or our systems folks went ahead and did some additional registration. And I'm real sorry, I don't know, uh, I don't know the details of that. Um, I do know how to register in Google Scholar, which is obviously the same thing as, as, as you do. So in summary, um, libraries use more than just MARC records in providing access to publisher content. That was one of the things that I, when I talked with the Springer folks, I, I meant, uh, several of them, when I talked with them about what libraries, the data they provide to libraries, and their whole context was, oh, well, we provide MARC records for the library catalog. And it's like, well, libraries use a lot more than just the library catalog and providing access to publisher content. You know, so, so you need to make sure that you have that larger context as well. Uh, metadata that is created by publishers is distributed to various systems and not just to libraries. That, Google's, that Google example is a perfect example of that. And in fact, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're a publisher and you're working in editorial, for example, if you make an error in a publisher name or in a title word or something like that, that error just isn't reflected just on your publisher's website. It's like that error goes out to library catalogs and it goes, it goes out to the web as a whole because that same citation with the same description, the same abstract appeared not only in the library discovery service, it appeared in Google, it appeared in the library catalog, you know. So, you, so metadata is repurposed in ways that publishers I think sometimes are not even really aware of. Um, I mean, or a small set of the staff within a, public, within a publication operation, publisher operation. Any source that supports open URL can, t can potentially provide access to publisher content. So any database that says they support open URL, you can profile, you can, you can get your open URL link in there, and it can potentially provide access to publisher content. Uh, 
And metadata accuracy is about more than correct transcription. It's also about correct coding. It's also about understanding, and this, and this is really important for the discovery service. The discovery service really has to do good validation on the content that they receive, whether it's a, whether it's a large commercial service like OCLC, or whether it's um, the library who's creating their own discovery service, who's using some commercial product like Primo, but sort of has their own discovery service you know, within that, and they're maintaining that. You really have to understand the value of all of the elements. You really have to understand, you really have to validate the stuff that's coming in to make sure that you don't get those inaccuracies. So I see that there's another question. Um, what has Springer changed or plans to change as a result of my presentation? Um, I don't know if they plan to change anything. I think that I think that there was um, the people who were responsible, and she provide and and the questioner provides some examples of uh, providing better information for link resolvers or more complete ebook records for the catalog. I the reason that I was there, the people who are responsible sort of on the production side for metadata, like the metadata, Miriam Kessler, who's their head of metadata services, or the people who are providing the um, XML feeds to the link resolver companies or to the knowledge base companies like Serious Solutions. Those people uh, understand the services and know what they need, know what needs to happen. I think the issue is with the people on the editorial side and the production side who didn't understand the importance of the data that they were working with and how it was used. Uh, I think one of the things that Springer wanted to get out of this was to have them have a higher awareness of how important the accuracy was of the work that they were doing. So I think it was more a general goal rather than a very specific goal. Um, yeah, publisher metadata. I, there's one other question from uh, from this questioner as well. With metadata coming from many sources into the discovery service, what issues are there for metadata maintenance, and how are they addressed, especially publisher metadata? There's a lot of issues. Publishers, and this happens. I just did a presentation in Charleston on um, when platform providers change their platform when they migrate from one platform to another. Publishers tend to think, or content providers tend to think that the only thing they need to change is the URL, basically the access point for it, and then um, and then everything's hunky dory. You know, they can send out another set of records with new URLs and everything's finished. Well, I mean that would be nice, and if and if and if content providers make that realization, that's a good first step. But oftentimes there are other changes that have to do with maybe when they move to a maybe when they migrate to a new platform. At the same time, they say, "Oh, we, we're going to digitize all our back content for this one journal, and we're going to make that available." They need to make sure that they also maintain the coverage data, you know, update the coverage data that they're sending to the link resolver companies, so that link resolution happens correctly. So that's just one example of of uh, the kind of maintenance that needs to happen. Um, and publishers are really different. One of the reasons that I had that I want to do this presentation in several different um, areas is this really is geared more towards publishers to give them a, an awareness of how important it is, how important the data that they uh, provide is, and how important it is for it to be accurate and current. Um, so, um, so, and as my final in my final word, I just want to tell everyone out there that library catalogers can no longer do it all. You know, in order for us, with cataloging departments shrinking, with um, technical services um, budget shrinking, um, we are more and more reliant on the data that publishers provide about the content that they license to us. And it's becoming a, you know, in some, in sometimes, Sometimes it actually, it's, it's never usually in terms of a, per, of a purchase decision, usually whether a publisher provides metadata or not is not a big consideration, but it's becoming more and more of a consideration. I mean, I mean, libraries are actually looking at, oh, well, okay, we're going to buy this thing. How are we going to provide access to it? You know, is the only way someone gets to the content is by searching the database, or can we actually link to it from other things? 
so that's becoming more and more of an of an issue. So for my final slide, and these slides will be available uh, after the presentation, so there's no need to jot all these URLs down. But I just wanted to uh, present three resources that can that can help publishers and libraries as well um, with understanding this whole uh, what I've just what I've just gone through. Uh, KBART, knowledge bases and related tools, is a practice that is a, I don't know if it's actually a standard. Um, I think it's a guide, guidelines and practice that have been developed by uh, UKSG. Uh, and if you if you're a publisher who's thinking about sending data to a third party service, some third party service con like Serial Solutions contacts you and said we'd like to get some coverage data from you about your journals. This is the standard. This is the gold standard to follow. You know, take a look at that document. Um, the uh, the second uh, resource was developed by the Program for Cooperative Cataloging. It's basically instructions if a, if an aggregator or a content provider is going to create mark records. This is a really good guide. It was just updated last year to to show what fields they need to send, what the mark format looks like, you know that that kind of information. So that's good for. Um, for publishers. And then the last uh, resource is not specifically a metadata resource, but it's more about display and presentation of electronic journals. It's a working group that I was, a NISO working group that I've been on that's almost close to finished. I think we'll be coming out with us with a final set of working guidelines by the end of the year. Um, so if you're so if you're a publisher or a content provider and you're providing access to e-journal content, I would strongly suggest you uh, look at that guideline. So um, I think that's it. I don't see any other questions coming across at that point and at this point, and we're close to the end of our time. So uh, Todd, I will uh, hand it back to you for a final wrap up. All right. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, quick reminder to everyone, a recording of this session will be made available to everyone who registered for the next day or so. So if you are having audio problems and missed part of it, you will get a chance to hear that. And also, whenever you uh, log out of the webinar, you will be directed to a survey. I like to ask once again that you please take some time to fill that out to give us some feedback on how we did and what other topics you might be interested in. And with that, on behalf of the NASA Continuing Education Committee, thank you again for attending our webinar, and we hope to see you next time.